All right, as we, as we shift gears and uh, enter into uh, the sermon today, we're going to be in Judges chapter 10. Judges chapter 10. We're actually covering a pretty large section today, so we're not going to have an extended reading, but we're going to be trying to tackle Judges 10, 11, and 12, so three chapters of this Old Testament narrative. So uh, if you are using one of those black Bibles in the, in the uh, chairs around you, it is on page 210. 210 in those Bibles. So Judges chapter 10, and let me just uh, pray for us as we get started here. Father, we need you this morning. We, we need you desperately. And uh, all the words that can be said, all the study that can, that can be done on this text is fruitless apart from your spirit taking these truths and implanting them into our very hearts. And I pray that this morning you would, you would break down any stony hearts and give us a heart of flesh, a heart that is tender to receive truth from you. I pray that you would open up our eyes to behold the wonder and glory of the gospel, even in this dark book of Judges. I pray that you would just aliven us to your spirit this morning and magnify your name uh, amongst all of us today. It's in the beautiful name of our Savior, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. So let me ask you guys a question. Do you guys ever have those uh, double-take moments? You know what I'm talking about? Those moments where you see something that's so kind of crazy and unexpected that uh, at first glance you don't quite notice it, and then you have to kind of look again to really see it and understand what's going on. Well, uh, something like this kind of happened to, uh, to me a few weeks ago as my wife and I were driving across the, the barren wasteland of southern Wyoming. We were heading up to the beautiful area of Wyoming in the Tetons, but uh, we were heading across that rough stretch of I-80. We're, we're driving along, and my wife turns to me, and she says, hey, look at that. And I look over, and it's, there's a guy on a bike. And I, at first, I like see it, and, I'm, and my initial thought is like, what's the big deal? It happens all the time. But then, all of a sudden, I look closer, and this dude is riding not just any ordinary bike. He's riding one of those, those bikes with the huge front wheel and the little tiny wheel, like the original bike, like down I-80. <laughs> I'm like, I have no idea how far he had come or where he's going, how far he's riding, but if you've ever been in that section of road, he's come a long ways and he's got to go a long ways. So I don't know, more power to him. I don't know if that's a thing, but I want nothing to do with, with that. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it was, just, it was one of those moments where I had to just look again. I'd never seen such a thing. Well, I feel like as, we, as you read through the book of Judges, you have a lot of those moments, right? Those moments where you just stop and are like, what, what did I just read? Like go back to the story of Ehud. You know, where you're reading along, and there's this, this left-handed guy, and he comes along, and then he goes, and he's, he's entering in, he's going to assassinate this king, and you're like, whoa, this is getting kinda, kind of intense. Then all of a sudden, he goes, and he has this sword, and he, he plunges it into this, this fat man, and then the, the, the text actually reads, and the dung came out. And in that moment, sometimes you're like, what did I just re read? What's going on here? And then, then when we move on, and we see this other story where this, this woman takes a tent peg and, and drives it through a man's head. And at times you're like, is, is this the Bible that I'm reading? This sounds more like, like a zombie story or something that's going on. Like, like what's happening here? Like, these stories are, are shocking. They're, they're unexpected. They, they cause us to take a second look at, like, like, is this really in the Bible? And our story today kind of, kind of fits that theme. It's, it's, it's a very dark story. It takes a very dark twist and turn. Something that causes us to kind of go, to take a second look and, and be like, what, what's happening? What do I do with this text? But the reason that this book is so brutal and describes these absolutely terrible acts is because it's meant to show us the tragic road of decline that the people of God have gone down as they have allowed the surrounding culture to erode their faith in God. It's meant to be shocking. And as we have seen over and over again, the book follows this kind of cyclical pattern in the nation of Israel, right? And if you remember, just to remind us, it starts with, as Aaron laid out, kind of this initial rebellion where the people turn away from God and they, they embrace the idols of the surrounding culture. Then there is retribution in which God comes in and, and, and allows these nations to take them over. And they are oppressed Eventually, it typically leads towards this repentance in which the, the nation then turns back to God. And then God sweeps in and raises up a judge and offers this, this restoration. And so this cyclical pattern has been going on in the, in, in, in the lives of these judges as we've seen. Ehud, Deborah, Gideon, and now we'll see in the life of Jephthah. And it is this similar cyclical pattern, but as you look at it as a whole, 
It's not just over and over again in a, in, a, in a linear fashion. It's more of a downward spiral that we see in the nation. And the book keeps getting kind of darker and darker to where at the end of Jephthah, we see that the time of peace that he brings to the nation is, is, is a very small time compared to the time that they were oppressed. And so we see things getting worse and worse, and this common theme keep popping up, there was no king in Israel. That's where, that's where it's heading. And so today's story gets very disturbing. It's not really a fun story to read. It's one that usually gets left out of children's books, one that gets left out of children's curriculum, maybe, in Sunday school. But it's one that we don't just want to pass over and skip, because there's warnings here that are for us. There are lessons that we need to learn from the things that we see in the nation of Israel during this time. And ultimately, we all need to be reminded once again that we are a people like Israel in need of a better judge and a true deliverer. So as we look at the story of Jephthah, we're going to see this warning. And the warning is this, that conforming to the surrounding culture may lead to spiritual decline. And we're going to see four movements throughout these, four, these three chapters where we see that. We see how this, this spiritual decline is evidenced itself in the nation of Israel and how we often see those same things in our own lives. So let's get after it. The beginning of chapter 10, verses 6 to 9, sets the stage. And the, and the, and the first way that we see this is that conforming to the surrounding culture in our worship may lead to becoming slaves to the idols that we worship. So chapter 10 sets the stage once again for the need for another judge to be raised up within the nation. This time it's in the area of Gilead. And so if you, if you, if you could picture in your mind the nation of Israel and there's the, uh, the, the, the Dead Sea and the, the Jordan River going up to the Sea of Galilee. This is just to the east side of the Jordan River is where things are happening right here. And this area comes under oppression from the nation of Ammon to their east. Now keep in mind that as each of these judges kind of comes along, they're not necessarily ruling over the entire nation or, or the oppression that's seen isn't over the entire nation all the time. But what's happening is it's localized situations and specific areas where idolatry is popping up and we see it spreading like a cancer throughout the nation. And so here it's kind of centralized over on the east side of the nation in which the, the, the area of, of Gilead is under oppression from the nation of Ammon. And we have these familiar words that we've read over and over again where it says, Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And then it goes on to list the foreign gods that they begin to worship. And here at this point, is, it's the most extensive list of, of the nations that they've adopted gods from. So it says, they did evil in the sight of God. They served the Baals and the Ashtaroth, in verse 6, and the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. And then there's this, this powerful phrase where it says, they forsook the Lord and did not serve Him. So they have continued to just, just pile up more and more false gods to worship. And they've gotten to the point where they're not merely just kind of bringing these gods alongside of the true God, alongside of Yahweh, but they've actually forsaken Yahweh completely, kind of pushed him out and actually have chosen these other gods over their true God. And the oppression then that is brought in from the nation of Ammon is severe. As they come in and they take over this area of Gilead, then they cross over and even impact the, the tribes of, of Judah and Benjamin. So then chapter 11 opens up with, let me get my notes here straight, straight. So they take over. And uh, as, as they have adopted the idols of the surrounding culture, it is, it is, it is the very uh, nations of the idols that they sought to worship that now enslave them. And so the lesson for us, as, as, as we think about the, the, the idols that we worship in our own lives, it leads us to just this, this implication. 
That we have to realize that, that when you worship an idol, it's often that same idol that ultimately enslaves you. It's the very gods which Israel sought which brings them under oppression. Tim Keller says this, he says, idolatry leads to slavery, and slavery leads to further idolatry. You see, when you worship false gods and you become enslaved to those gods, those gods take over, and they're set up as the ruler of our life, and then those gods keep making more and more demands on our lives. You see, the God of money and prosperity will never be appeased. The God of sex is never satisfied. The God of entertainment always needs more attention. The gods of approval or our own self-image can never receive enough worship. But they always require more and more of us. And the more we worship them, the more we bow down to them, the more that we become enslaved to them ourselves. And so all throughout this book, we keep seeing this warning against idolatry and just this constant reminder that we have to be watchful of what we are worshiping. We constantly need to take an inventory of the, of the idols that may have crept in because it's not always the same idols that keep came, coming up in Israel. But there's new ones that keep coming up. As they tear one down, others raise up from another place. And our hearts keep creating new idols that we seek to turn to rather than to God. So the first thing that we see is that conformity to the world results in enslavement to these idols. And the second way that conformity to the cultural gods destroys our faith is that it may lead us to start responding to sin with regret rather than with repentance. And we see this in verses 10 to 18 of chapter 10. Verse 10, we, we see what first looks like the third step of the cyclical pattern. It looks like people are, start, are, are wanting to turn back to God, right? And in verse 10, it says this. It says, The people of Israel cried out to the Lord, We have sinned against you because we have forsaken our God and have served the Baals. But then God responds in a way that's very different here than he has previously. And God comes back and responds with these words. He says, The Lord said, did I not save you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites and the Ammonites and from the Philistines, the Sidonians also, and the Amalekites and the Moanites? You cried out to me and I saved you out of their hand, yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will save you no more. Go and cry out to the gods whom you have chosen. Let them save you in the time of your distress." So you see, Israel cries out for deliverance because they're in this trouble. They're being oppressed. They need something from God. But, but it seems that like God knows their hearts. He knows what they're getting after. He knows what they're doing. And they don't actually want to turn back to Yahweh and actually worship Him. They simply want Him to save their skin in this situation. They're in a state of desperation, but their heart is not at the point of contrition. So God responds. He says, hey guys, why don't you go cry out to all those other gods that you're worshiping? All those other idols. Hey, I have saved you over and over and over again. And yet you continue to turn away and run after these other gods. So God says, hey, have at it. Call out to them. See how much they care for you. And he calls them out on, on their, their, their regret over what's going on rather than their repentance. So the question for us is, how do we know whether we're actually responding to sin with regret? I think, first of all, it starts when, we, when we're desperate to get past the effects of sin on our own lives, but we fail to realize the effect that sin has on God. Do we recognize and consider that Jesus died for the very sins that we are committing? That it was our very sins that we continue to run after that put Christ on the cross? And do we realize that Christ died to pay for sin and to free us from it, not merely to give us a free pass to uh, pursue it? See, God wants to deliver us from the punishment of sin, but He also has offered to give us freedom from the bondage of sin. 
And we so often want to get past the effects that it just has on ourselves horizontally or in our relationships maybe, but we fail to realize that the most devastating effect of sin is what it has on the vertical relationship with God. Another way that we oftentimes may be responding to sin with regret rather than repentance is that we desire to be free from shame, but we still want to keep the idols close by. You see, Israel didn't want to get rid of their idols. It's not until, G- until God calls them out on this that they then later put the idols out. But they wanted, they wanted to kind of keep those idols alongside of Yahweh and say, hey, God, come and help us, come and help us. But, uh, you know, we, we're just still going to keep these, these other idols here. And do we not sometimes do the same? That we know something is deadly for us. We know that it has led us path, down a path of destruction over and over again. And yet we, we want God to, to get, get rid of the shame and the guilt that we feel from that, but we still want to kind of keep, keep a place for it. We want to kind of keep, keep our options open, kind of run back to it for, for some, some, some sort of comfort if God doesn't come through. We aren't ready to truly cut it off from our lives. So do we respond with regret over our sin rather than true repentance? This is where Israel had arrived. And when God finally calls them out on this, we see their hearts changed. And in verses 15 to 16, it shows that they respond in true repentance. And this is what true repentance looks like. First of all, they identify their sin. They call it what it is. They say, we have sinned against you. There's no excuses, no justifying their actions. They next respond with the right motives, where they accept the consequences of their sin. They say, God, do to us whatever, whatever you see fit. And they're willing to accept the consequences for that sin. Third, they, they, they depend only on God to deliver. They cry out and say, God, it's up to you. You please deliver us. And then lastly, they turn from the idols. It says that they put away the foreign gods from among them, and they turned back to serving God. True repentance always involves turning from something, putting it away, and turning to God. And so we always have to keep a watch on our own hearts. Do we respond to our sin merely with regret because of its effects kind of in our life and the inconvenience that it may bring? Or do we respond with repentance and understanding what our sin does to God, what, what, how He views it, how He died for it, and how He desires to free us from it? So number two, they responded to sin with regret rather than repentance. And then number three, the third way that Israel's spiritual decline results from conforming to the culture is that they start relating to God like pagans. They start relating to God like a pagan. And this is Judges 11, where we see the story of Jephthah really come into full focus. At the end of chapter 10, we we see this scene of the pagan nation of the Ammonites. They are set against the people of Israel, and they're going to fight. And and Israel is left with one question, who is going to fight for us? Who's going to lead us into battle? And chapter 11 enters in the man Jephthah. And again, we see that God uses an unexpected deliverer. It's someone who is least likely the the guy that anybody would have picked to deliver Israel. So 11 verses 1 to 3 says this. It says, now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty warrior, but he was the son of a prostitute. Gilead was the father of Jephthah, and Gilead's wife also bore him other sons. And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob, and worthless fellows collected around Jephthah and went out with him. So we see this man Jephthah. He was a bad dude. He was a, he was a mighty warrior. He was a strong fighter. But... He was born to a prostitute, and because of that, he was rejected by his brothers. 
He was cast out from his people as, as worthless. They wanted nothing to do with him. And then he goes and he lives in this desert town called Tob. And there, he is, as he's there, he kind of gathers around this other, this other group of, of, of bad dudes. The, uh, the, the, the text here is, is really tough. You'll, you'll see a variety of, of translations for this word, worthless fellows or whatever. But basically, it looks like he's out there in the desert as kind of this uh, leader of this kind of mercenary group. Or maybe there, he's kind of a, a crime boss or something like that. And certainly his renown has, has come to be known because of uh, his leading these other men and his, his uh, ability to fight and win battles. So he's a hard guy living out in the, living out in the desert, leading this, this group of mercenaries. But the leaders of Israel are desperate, and they need somebody to, to, to lead them. So they turn to the last guy on earth that they want to lead them. And in desperation, they turn to Jephthah. And so this, this story is kind of like that movie, The Rock, you know, The, the Rock back, back in the day with Sean Connery. And in that, in that movie, if you haven't seen it, this, this group of, uh, of terrorists take over the island of Alcatraz. And from there, they're going to launch nerve gas into the city unless their demands are met. And so the good guys have to, have to try to get in there and break into Alcatraz, but, but nobody can do that except for one guy. So they turn to the one guy who had ever broken out of Alcatraz, this criminal that they, want, that they wanted nothing to do with. And so they, they finally make a deal, they cut a deal with this guy to help them break back into Alcatraz to take things over and save the city. And that same kind of thing is going on here. The, the, the Israelite leaders are turning to the last guy that they want. This guy who's probably a criminal, who's viewed negatively by society, he's an outcast, but they're desperate, so they turn to him. And so you can could, could just kind of see the, the scene of, of how this goes down. You know, these guys come up, hey, Jephthah, how's it going? Hey, man, sorry about the last few years, you know, that time when we kicked you out. You know, we were just joking about that. You know, we really love you. You know, we, we'd love you to, for, to come alongside and fight for us. And Jephthah responds almost like God did in the last section. He says, hey, guys, you had wanted nothing to do with me. You cast me out. And now because you're in a bind, you want me to rescue you? Why should I do that? And Jephthah, ultimately, as he's a pretty savvy guy, it looks like, he uh, makes a deal with them and says, hey, if you guys will actually make me the true leader, set me up as the judge over the people, then yeah, I'll help you out. I'll enter into battle. And if I win, then I stay as leader. And so they, they agree and they say, okay, okay, we'll do it. So Jephthah returns back home and he steps in to try to address and deal with this Ammonite takeover. And he's a, he's a savvy negotiator, so he starts with just uh, trying, to, trying to talk things over with the Ammonites. And so there's this large section in chapter 11 from verses 12 to 28 that really is just this dialogue over land rights. And we're not going to get into all the details there. You guys can read it and understand what's going on there. But basically, Je Jephthah offers three arguments. He offers a historical argument saying, hey, look, we didn't actually take this land from you. It was another group that we were fighting with that attacked us that we got it from. Then he offers a theological argument, says, hey, our God gave us this land. You guys just need to go be happy with the land that you were given from your God, Chemosh. And so he says, says just accept what your God gave you. And then lastly, he's, he offers this, uh, this final argument where he says, basically, we've had this land for 300 years, so you have no rights for it. No other countries have, have tried to take it from us, so why are you stepping in here now? You're in the wrong. So he, so he argues that, that the land rightly belongs to Israel. The Ammonite king, however doesn't listen, doesn't care, and so it appears that a battle is imminent. And it's after verse 29 that the story begins to take a very dark turn. And there's this, uh, this tragic story of Jephthah's vow before God. In order to understand what's happening here, it's crucial to, to look at verse 29. So 11 verse 29 says this, says, then the spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah. And he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed on to the Ammonites. So it says, the spirit of the Lord was upon him. This language of the spirit being upon Jephthah as he went into battle is the same statement that was used to refer to what happened with Othniel, with Gideon, and later with Samson. And this act of the spirit of God coming on an individual in the Old Testament 
means the empowering of a person by God to accomplish a specific task or purpose for the most part. And so in this endeavor to take on the Ammonite army, Jephthah is empowered by God, and God will fight for Israel, and He will bring about victory. We see, though, that Jephthah isn't so certain. He doesn't necessarily trust God in that way. And it appears that Jephthah has been so influenced by the pagan idolatry and the practices around him that he feels like he has to make some kind of deal with God in order to coerce God into delivering them. So Jephthah makes this vow that he will soon regret, much like Daniel last week. And he says, he says this, he said, God, if you will give me victory... Then when I return from battle, the first thing that meets me when I come back to my house, I will offer that as a sacrifice to you. And if if, if you read the text, we see what transpires. They go into battle. God delivers Israel victorious over the Ammonites. They're celebrating. He returns home. And who comes out to meet him? It's his only child, his daughter. And upon seeing her, the the story portrays him as just being crushed, being sorrowful and regretting deeply this vow that he just had made. But maybe you're thinking, well, he probably, when he made the vow, was expecting his, his dog or his chicken to come out of his house, right? Certainly, certainly that's what he was like thinking when he made the vow, right? Well, not necessarily. I don't think so. The, 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 the words that are used here in reference to, to him meeting someone when he, when he comes out is never used in the Old Testament of, 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 of meeting an animal. It's always re- referred to a personal meeting. And so it's most likely that Jephthah, in this vow, is, offer, is willing to offer human sacrifice in exchange for victory. And if you remember Aaron at the beginning of, of the introduction to this book, he talked about the surrounding cultures and the surrounding religions. And he talked about how offering their children as human sacrifice was part of their religion, was part of their culture, this dark and evil practice that went on around them. And it would appear that Jephthah has bought into this pagan theology and thinks that God actually wants some kind of human sacrifice in exchange for helping him win the battle. Now, certainly, maybe he did expect one of his servants to come out, or maybe his mother-in-law, but got to lighten the mood, got to lighten the mood. But but unfortunately, it's, it's his daughter, and he's crushed when he realizes what he has done. Now, some theologians have sought to kind of soften this, this text, and, and maybe it's possible that, that the dedication that, that, is, that is meant here, the sacrifice that is offered, is more one of, of offering his daughter for perpetual like, service to God in the tabernacle. And that's maybe an outside chance of that being true. Um, but I don't think that that's the most natural reading of the text. And in the scope of the story, what's actually happening here is something very dark. The most natural reading of the text reveals that Jephthah, because he had adopted the theology of the surrounding nations, offers his daughter as a sacrificial offering to God to, in his mind, square up a deal that he had made with God. This is how far the nation had fallen. So when we read a story like this in the Bible, we're oftentimes left just wondering, what do I do with this? Why is this here? I mean, none of us are even considering offering a sacrifice like this to God. This isn't even on the table in, in any way. So what do we do with this? It's, it's awful. It's tragic. How is this even in the Bible? What good are we supposed to take from this? I think it's important for us to realize that, that, that our actions may not be so severe. But sometimes do we not have a similar mindset We may not act in such extreme manners, but sometimes our theology can be just as twisted. 
How many of us have ever tried to make a deal with God, so to speak? Right? Maybe you've been there at the point in your life where you're experiencing the ravages of sin or just difficulty. And you cry out and say, God, if you'll get me out of this, then I'll really get serious about this Christianity thing. If you fix this situation in my life, get me through this, you know, then, then my life is all yours. I'll, uh, I'll go to church, I'll clean up my life, I'll start, I'll start, I'll start getting, getting back on track, but just get me out of this. Or perhaps some of us maybe op- operate as if we have some kind of special offering to give to God. And as we give those things, we, we receive in exchange His help or, or maybe even just His approval. Sure, maybe we're not as crass as Jephthah. Maybe we don't make a formal vow to God. But do we sometimes think in the back of our minds that God maybe owes us stuff because of everything that we have done for Him? Maybe we give faithfully every week here at the church, and every time we, we drop that envelope or that check in the, in, in the box, we just kind of uh, take a, a subtle mental note of just, uh, you know, how giving, how generous we are, and how probably, you know, this, this week's going to have a little bit more favor from God because of that. You know, maybe, maybe you get up, read your Bible faithfully for a week, you go to life group, you even help clean the church building. You know, we kind of pat ourselves on the back thinking, you know, man, look how loving and serving we are. You know, I'm doing pretty good in this. I'm really serving. But then maybe we go home and our marriages are struggling. Our kids are disobedient. Job situation's a little rough. Bills are maybe pressing in on us. People around us don't maybe seem to care about us as much as we'd like. And how do we respond then? Do we sometimes maybe have a tendency to start thinking, hey God, don't you see all the stuff that I've done for you? Don't you see how, how serving I have been and how loving I've been towards people? Like, like, what have you done for me lately? Sure, we may not say it out loud, but doesn't it maybe cross your mind here and there? Or am I maybe the only one so fleshly? You see, we have to realize as Jephthah did not, that God does not need our offerings. God didn't need Jephthah's vow, and he certainly did not want Jephthah to carry it out. But what he wanted was Jephthah to rely on him to deliver because he had promised that he would be faithful to his people. Just as he had done over and over again, he wanted Jephthah to cry out and depend on God, not strike a deal with him. And you see, we have to realize that God's love toward us is not contingent upon our amazing Christian performance or our moral perfection, but his love for us is rooted in his perfect character. It's rooted in his divine will to choose to love sinners and rebels like you and me. And the guarantee of His love towards us and the fulfillment of His covenant promises to us is not primarily seen in the way He responds to our acts of service, but it's primarily seen in His act of redemption where He loved us and He died for us while we were still sinners, as it says in Romans. So we must not relate to God like the pagan culture around us, where we're in sort of a give-and-take relationship with God, where if we scratch His back, He'll kind of scratch ours. But we relate to God like children, children who have been loved and saved by His grace alone. So then our service is, is born out of, out, of, out of having a loving Father who just cares for us and pours out upon us all the blessings of His Son. And so our response to Him is born out of understanding His grace. So Israel began to relate to Yahweh like the pagans related to their idols because they allowed the surrounding culture to so influence them and so impact them. And the final way, as we close this out, that conforming to the culture destroys Israel is that it leads to internal conflict. This is chapter 12. 
The final section closes down with Jephthah and the men of Gilead entering into a mini civil war with the neighboring tribe of Ephraim. Now, Ephraim kind of has this, this uh, petty beef with Jephthah and his guys, and they're mad because when they went into battle against the Ammonites, they supposedly didn't call for them to help. And so Jephthah and them got all the glory, and Ephraim didn't get, didn't get to partake in that. Well, Jephthah responds saying, hey, we've asked you guys for help in the past, and you guys didn't come out and, out and help us, so you know, we're just, we just went and did it on our own. It's kind of this petty dispute that really ultimately leads to this really bloody battle and fighting even within the nation. This battle breaks out and Jephthah's men crush Ephraim. And in the aftermath of this battle, there's this kind of weird story of finding the fugitives from Ephraim. And so they're there along the river and uh, as, as men are coming across trying to get back to Ephraim, they're checking to see where they're from. And how they're doing this is they, they give the men a test. As they come up, they say, hey, are you, are you from the tribe of Ephraim? And if they said no, then they would give them this test. And they would say, pronounce the word Shibboleth. And it says that those who were from Ephraim couldn't pronounce it properly, and they would only say Sibboleth. And then if they said Sibboleth, they were put to death because they were from this other tribe. So it's just this weird story. It's kind of, you know, we have a lot of different uh, kind of areas and people talk funny in different parts of the country. You know, we, we talk totally normal. Normal English is right here in northern Colorado, right? But this is kind of like uh, if we had somebody from Boston and we wanted to see, hey, are you from Boston? We would say, hey, say park the car. And what would they say? Park the car, right? <laughs> right? And we'd know you're from Boston. So I love that area, but they do not know how to, how to pronounce things right. So, <laughs> hey, my, my wife's family is from there, so I, I, I can say that. So, anyway. But anyway, this, this, this just tragic, weird story kind of, kind of is set forth. And, and ultimately, what this points to is not just some random fact of Israel, but the, it points to this, that the nation has fractured to the point where now they're speaking different dialects, they have a broken language, and there's now fighting and civil war even happening within the nation, not merely from without. The influence of the surrounding nations had destroyed the unity that should have existed throughout Israel. They were to be a distinctly identified people set apart and unified as the people of God. And that was being fractured and destroyed as we see throughout this book. And so for us, do we sometimes allow foreign idols of maybe our preferences, our desires of the way things should be, to even come into the church, to come into our life groups, to come into our homes and destroy the unity that we should have around the gospel, around the worship of God? How often do we let just peripheral matters just eat at us and cause conflict and fighting even within ourselves? We saw this earlier in the book of James, right, when we went through it, where he asks, what causes quarrels and fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet, and so you fight and quarrel. And so there's just this reminder and this challenge and warning to us that we must guard against the idols of our own desires, our own covetous hearts that may destroy the unity and love that we should have within the body of Christ. So as we wrap up things here today, you know, we often look at these judges and at their lives and we often see either things that are, that are kind of positive or negative, things that we should either try to emulate in ourselves or try to avoid. And certainly there are times where there's, where there's either vices or virtues that, that do apply directly to us individually that we could see in, in their lives. But I think overall in the scope of the whole book, it's really important to see that we most oftentimes see ourselves in the nation of Israel, in God's people, in what they're doing. And then we see God, through the judges, 
pointing us to Jesus, pointing us to our need of a, of a better judge, a true deliverer. And it's not that these are exact types of Jesus necessarily. But you know, it's, it's, it's just that they show us that we need someone that's better, better than these judges could bring. And you see, we mirror so many of Israel's failures and their faults in our own lives, don't we? We enslave ourselves to the idols in our culture. We numb our consciences to the point where we view sin with regret rather than repentance. We fall into patterns of relating to God like the pagans relate to their false gods. And we try to trade off God with some of our offerings from time to time. We get so focused on false idols within the church that it leads to conflict, bitterness, and tensions even within the body at times. But the good news is that in light of our many failures, in light of all of Israel's failures, we see a God who is still faithful to us, a God who still extends forgiveness and grace to us. He reaches down and provides deliverance. You see, God raised up Jephthah, and he used him to bring a brief period of deliverance amidst all of his flaws and failures. But Jephthah points us to our need of a better judge, one who would rightly relate to his father, one who would be rejected by his brothers, would spend time cast out in the wilderness. But this true deliverer would come, and he would not offer another child's life to appease God, but he would lay down his own life as an atoning sacrifice for the people. And it's only when we, just as Israel was called to do, when we look to a more perfect judge, and we look to Jesus, the true king, it's only then can we find full and final deliverance. So let's pray and ask God to fix our eyes together on the true judge and the true king.